Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, an honor to be in this uh, very auspicious group of people and uh, to be presenting on this extremely important subject. These are my conflicts of interest. Sepsis is totally different than other forms of shock in that there is an associated inflammatory response which causes a vasoplegia, a loss of adrenergic responsiveness, a pathological vasodilation, and capillary leak. These things cause a hypotensive state to occur which alters and eliminates blood flow autoregulation. And this hypotension is a medical emergency. And in the resuscitation of a septic shock patient, it is impossible to discuss fluid resuscitation independent of vasopressor therapy. Hypotension is a medical emergency. It must decrease blood flow of the heart and the brain. Other organs can have a happening, but you lose autoregulation. I cannot autoregulate blood flow. It induces strong sympathetic tone, and that's nice. But within that context of the acute resuscitation of a patient who presents in septic shock, cardiac output is only important to maintain the pressure. What pressure should you use? Well, we have this wonderful French study that Asfar was the first author, the senior author was Jean-Louis Thibault, in which they compared septic shock patients who had fluid resuscitation, and then they gave them pressors to get the mean arterial pressure between 85, 80 to 85, or 75 to, to 65 to 75. But I want to show you in the 65 to 75 group, which is the lower one, you don't even see the word 65 on this graph, because I think the nurses were afraid to stay that low. What they found was no difference in mortality, but they were smart enough to separate the patients into those with pre-existing hypertension. And if you looked at patients who had pre-existing hypertension, they had a significantly higher level of renal failure and the need for renal replacement therapy. If you didn't have pre-existing hypertension, you didn't. Well, why don't I just give norepinephrine to get the mean arterial pressure to 85 in everyone? Well, if you do, you'll have cardiovascular complications, which were higher in the patients given vasopressors. So the answer is, is that you should get the mean arterial pressure to 65 to 75 in a norm previously normal tensive person, or probably 80 to 85 if they have hypertension. The, sorry. So what is the exact resuscitation I should do in the septic shock patient? Well, I think I agree with many people that you don't have to follow chapter and verse of doing exactly everything the same. And even though we do have guidelines that are out from the surviving sepsis group and ones that we published uh, in the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine just last year with uh, Sassoni as the first author, I was on that committee, um, those are simply guidelines to suggest what we're going to do. The important point is it doesn't matter if you target a certain oxygen delivery, you do a certain measurement, as the soda in our process study that was done by Derek Angus and the group at the University of Pittsburgh, but it was a multi-center trial. Mortality was the same in all groups. And this is the important slide. If you look at the amount of fluids and vasopressors that were given to the patients, the patients in the goal direct, the standard therapy got a significantly higher amount of fluids approximately a liter in the first hour, and then a falling off. Whereas if you use protocolized therapy, you gave less. And if you simply ask people to do what they do normally, and remember, mortality was the same in all groups. They gave a smaller amount of therapy. There was no special need to put in a central venous catheter, but in the normal groups that had anything, they could put a central venous catheter in if they wanted, which is 50% of the time. You didn't need to measure SCVO2 which is assessment of perfusion, but if you did, that was fine. The concept is, is that that study and the others don't say you shouldn't measure SCVO2, don't say you shouldn't put in a central venous line. What they say is if you want a central line, put it in. If you think you need to measure SCVO2 to assess that you have enough flow that the O2 saturation, the venous blood is higher, do. But if you don't think you need it, don't do it. Okay. So, now let's go on to fluids. We've now got the pressure up and we want to give fluid resuscitation in our septic patient. We need to look at organ function because the goal in life is tissue wellness. Regrettably, organ function changes are too late for us to follow. Once we have the microcirculation, the perfusion there, we need to increase oxygen transport to the tissues to reverse the tissue ischemia. 
I'm very honored that the initial studies that were done by Israel Perel on stroke pulse pressure variation and then by us and with um, Frederick Makar and Jean-Louis Thibault on pulse pressure and stroke volume variation have permeated the literature so well over the last 10 to 15 years that this is now part of the standard. And I love that because, in fact, it has strong physiologic basis. Using pulse pressure and stroke volume variation is very accurate. But that just tells you that the patient's volume responsive. It doesn't tell you that they need fluids. The need of fluids is the statement that they have evidence of ischemia of their tissues, altered mental status, elevated lactate levels, decreased urine output, anion gap being very high. And therefore, to assess the need for fluids in a septic patient, you need to assess these things. Since patients in septic shock have capillary leak, they will never be in a steady state and will constantly be needing fluids over time until the capillary leak goes away. And they may often develop anasarca. That doesn't mean they don't need fluids if they're still hypovolemic. I'm sure you've seen this picture many times of the concept of if I have a good heart or a not so good heart during positive pressure breathing, I'm going to see a variation in my preload, and that's going to cause a stroke volume variation in volume responsive hearts. Eventually, the ones that aren't responsive won't have a stroke volume variation. The ones that are will, but eventually all hearts are no longer volume responsive. And in collaboration with Jose Marquez, we went into the operating room and we measured not only aortic pressure in, in patients and the arterial pressure during an inferior vena cable occlusion, but esophageal Doppler and pulse oximetry pleth variability. And we proved for the first time that there's a strong linear relationship between pulse pressure and stroke volume. And I can measure pulse pressure in anyone. And furthermore, you can also use pleth variability, as you heard from Thomas in the last lecture. So in collaboration with Frederick Makar and Jean-Louis Thibault, many years ago when I was in Paris, we did a study looking at the effects of pulse pressure variation to predict volume responsiveness. This first study was in ARDS patients, but the second study was in patients with severe septic shock on vasopressors. And in the septic shock patients, the second paper ever published, we showed that the pulse pressure variation was an excellent predictor of subsequent volume responsiveness. The greater the pulse pressure variation on an 8 ml per kilogram tidal volume, the greater the increase in stroke volume. There is no threshold value. If it's 0, it's 0. If it's 5, it's 5. If it's 10. So when people say that you're going to use a 10 percent, that's just simply because you're saying if it's less than that, it probably doesn't matter. The number of studies that have validated it, and you've seen this, is too numerous to count. In a Google search in 2009, there were 101 peer-reviewed papers showing that these methods, whether it be IBC, echocardiographic, uh, uh, catheter collapse, pleth variability, it doesn't matter. But you cannot use this in your spontaneously breathing patient. In this nice study, they looked at the effects of removing fluid and blood and giving fluid back prior to surgery so they'd have blood to give to patients. And they looked at the systolic pressure variation. And you can see as they took the fluid out, it went up. And they put the fluid back, it went down. These were patients on mechanical ventilation. That relationship was lost during spontaneous breathing because spontaneous breathing induces ventricular interdependence, and that change in preload is not the same. It's a change in volume but not wall stress. So what do you do? You heard about it already. You can do a passive leg raising, and in collaboration with Xavier Monet and Jean-Louis Thibault, we showed that, in fact, you can simply do what cardiologists have done for about 100 years, a passive leg raise, and if that is positive, you'll have an increase in cardiac output, and if your passive leg raise is negative, you don't have an increase. So with Daniel DeBacker, we propose that in patients who are breathing spontaneously, give them a volume challenge and if you can, or passive leg raising. Should you measure CVP? Yes. It's a stopping rule. If when you give volume, CVP goes up, stop. That's core pulmonale. But if you give volume and CVP doesn't increase by about two millimeters of mercury and you still are in need of flow, then you can give volume. Final point. Remember I said that there is loss of vasomotor tone and we increased mean arterial pressure to 65. Well, we need to know if arterial pressure is normal. Hypotension must always be pathological, but a normal blood pressure doesn't mean that I have normal vasomotor tone. So if I were to look at the relationship between arterial pulse pressure and stroke volume, I would see that as I increase the uh, 
stroke volume ought to increase the pulse pressure, and the slope of the line is dynamic arterial elastance. So if I have a given stroke volume and pulse pressure, and the stroke volume remains the same, but the pulse pressure decreases, I must have a decrease in dynamic elastance. And if for the same stroke volume the pulse pressure is higher, I must have an increase in dynamic elastance or vasomotor tone. And this isn't physiology, this is physics. This says to me that if I have a low dynamic elastance, even if cardiac output goes up, blood pressure will not. And Mange Garcia showed just that. In septic shock patients who are volume responsive but hypotensive, he wanted to know which ones would have an increase in arterial pressure. And only those with an arterial elastance greater than 0.9 did. So based on that, we can propose the following treatment algorithm to treat septic shock patients. The first question you want to say in sepsis is, is my patient stable or unstable? That is a very hard question to answer. But if they're stable, do nothing. I would suggest that you would measure perfusion parameters such as urine output, anion gap, lactate clearance, um, um, and SCVO2 and the delta CO2 gradients. But if they are not stable, you want to know if they're volume responsive. You've already heard about the functional measures you can use, pulse pressure, stroke volume variation, et cetera. The answer is yes or no, but you don't stop there. You say, is my patient hypotensive with a decrease in vasomotor tone, which is the pulse pressure variation to stroke volume variation relationship? And that, by the way, can be calculated with atrial arrhythmias, with spontaneous breathing. It has nothing to do with the heart. The answer is yes or no. Well, Half the patients in shock will be volume responsive and half won't. But if I'm volume responsive and I'm hypotensive and decrease vasomotor tone, that's the usual initial patient in septic shock. They need not only volume but a vasopressor, norepinephrine, simultaneously. But if they're hypotensive with normal vasomotor tone, if their cardiac output goes up, their blood pressure will go up. All they need is volume. But what about the patients who are no longer volume responsive and have hypotensive with decreased vasomotor tone? If they have that, that's like the septic shock patient who you've given all the fluid to. They're no longer volume responsive. They're still hypotensive. They need norepinephrine. But if they're no longer volume responsive, they don't have a decrease in vasomotor tone, but they're still hypotensive, the problem is between my two hands. I don't know what it is, but it's right here. And we would start an inotrope while we're looking for the echo machine to figure out what's going on. Is it a pulmonary embolus, tamponade, arrhythmia, or whatever? And this uh, model, which is present, is being used in the Morass study by Antonio Ortegas in the uh, Spanish Intensive Care Society in a prospective study of septic shock patients that's presently ongoing. So my recommendations are in monitoring, measure perfusion variables that are real, urine output, sensorium, mean arterial pressure, capillary refill. Then you can measure the adequacy of blow as looking at SVO2, strong ion gap, lactate clearance, and I forgot to mention the arterial to venous CO2 gradient. Functional parameters tell you if you're volume responsive. They don't tell you if you need volume, but if you are in need of volume and you're volume responsive, give volume. Trends are probably more important than absolute values. And in the management, fluids and vasopressors and norepinephrine is the vasopressor choice. And rarely, but sometimes, you'll actually have to give dobutamine to increase cardiac output in those patients who, when you give them fluid, no longer volume responsive and they still have an adequate perfusion. And with that, I thank you for your attention.